ka karore te kutu o te atanui, ka horai nga ka taki te umere, he pō, he pō, he ao ka awa te a. <coughs> a ko te mihi tua tahi, a, ki o tini ai tua, a hari atu, a hari atu rā, a hari atu ki te tāo to tūpuna, a te huinga mate, ki te huinga mate, a te huinga ora, ki te huinga ora. Ko te mihi tua rua, a, ki ka mauka, a, ka awa, a, ka whenua, a, kei raro, a tēnā koutou. Ka huri au ki a koutou ka toa, a nau mai hari mai tauti mai, nau mai hari mai tauti mai a, ki raro i tēnei a, tūnui. A nau mai hari mai tauti mai a, a, ki tēnei hui hui, a, he hui hui i a, a uh, whakahirahira uh, o te kaupapa um, mahi toi, o te kaupapa o te waias hoki. <coughs> I know my hari mai tauti mai. Kei te tū au kei raro i te maru uh, o uh, hoku uh, um, whanauka o tēnei, o ēnei uh, whare, o ēnei mauka, o ēnei uh, whenua. Kei te mihi i uh, Kia koe, Jane, uh, ki o uh, mahi kei roki i te, I te kaupapa, uh, te kaupapa mahi toi, engari to kaupapa uh, whakahirahira um, o tēnei uh, um, uh, takata o ēnei takata katoa, e kaupapa o te kōrero, o te waiata, uh, o te wairua hoki. Uh, so my first words, uh, I'll explain last. My second words were acknowledging those that passed on to the other side, all of those, those people that are close to us um, that would be fantastic to have here uh, in person today, but those people that are here um, that, 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 that sit with us and between us, uh, those people that are important to us that will never leave us. But they are with those that have passed on to the other side, and here we are today in this world of light. I then acknowledge the landscape that we're sitting in, that, that landscape that holds us all together, uh, that keeps us warm. The mountains, the rivers, the land that we put our feet on, I acknowledge those places. I turn to you all and, and welcomed you here today, to this wonderful day, this very important day. And... In this day we'll be listening to some stories and those stories will come ki waha, um, uh, akorero, and they'll come from way out to two, I, I dare say. Um, and as we're here, we offer warmth to our, to our friend, to Jane. Ko tēnei takata he to this person, this friend of ours, this hoa mahi. Uh, our colleague, but to this treasure that we have. This treasure who is today um, going through this pre process of whakamana, of, of us acknowledging the mana that she has, but not with us lifting her up there because she's already there, but us seeing who she is and acknowledging her for what we all know she is, that treasure, that tauka. Um, and I'll revert back now to those first words that I said. And that, that cut of care that I started off with is usually one that we use in the morning. And it talks about, um, it talks about the birds singing to welcome in a new day. It talks about uh, the, the birds twisting their lips to make the unusual sounds that they make. It talks about the birds um, sending forth a raucousness, a noise, that lets us all know that a new day has arrived. Kao, kao, kao atea. Here is a new sunrise. And we're lucky here, our friends, to acknowledge our treasure and the new sunrise that's rising for her, that new dawn that she is waking up in. And 
We are looking forward to hearing from her, from her twisted lips. <laughs> We're looking forward to hearing the raucous noise that will announce that new day. So, Katie Mihi, new new week here, please, Jane. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Caroline Terpstra. Uh, my name is Caroline Terpstra, I'm the Acting Head of College, Art Design and Architecture. Ron, you're always such a hard act to follow, <laughs> such a great orator, but um, kia ora Ron for your um, warm words of welcome and your kōrero to Jane. Um, it's my absolute <laughs> pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the College of Art, Design and Architecture at Otago Polytechnic. Um, Jane is a colleague and a friend and I feel really privileged to be asked to speak at, at this very special event. Um, before Jane delivers her professorial address, I'm just going to talk briefly about Jane the teacher, and more specifically about the way Jane embraces the Māori concepts of ako and afitanga, or afitaka, I think, um, because I think that's a really important part of who Jane is as a teacher and a person. Um, ARCOR describes a teaching and learning relationship where the teacher is also learning from the student and where teaching practices are informed by the latest research and are both deliberate and reflective. ARCOR is grounded in the principle of reciprocity and also recognises that the learner and the whānau cannot be separated. In a reciprocal learning relationship, teachers are not expected to know everything. In particular, our course suggests that each member of the class brings knowledge with them from which all are able to learn. Jane works with a wide range of learners, some of whom have not had positive learning experiences before coming to Otago Polytechnic. She understands how important it is for a learner to feel supported, not just by their lecturers, but by the wider whānau, their family, their friends, classmates and all other networks. So um, that allows them to feel that their contribution is valued and it allows them to participate to their full potential. So it's not about people simply getting along socially, it's about building productive relationships between the teacher and learners and among learners where everyone is empowered to learn with and from each other. Jane's respectful and inclusive approach to working with learners is strongly aligned to the Māori concept of afitanga. And uh, uh, that word comes from afi, to embrace, support, to nurture. And it means, afitanga means valuing and enabling diversity, equity and success for all learners, and particularly Māori and Pacifica learners. Jane's, I don't think she'll mind me saying this, Jane's own school experience was not always inclusive or respectful of difference and diversity. And um, I think she would say herself that she probably didn't fit the mould at school. So it's not surprising to me that Jane, Jane's inclusive approach to teaching and learning has developed in response to those formative experiences at school. Um, underpinning and absolutely fundamental to Jane's teaching is her very active art practice with its subversive commentary on human behaviour, often or oh, nearly always incorporating humour and music. <laughs> she brings all this to her teaching as well and her classes are enriched by her own multidisciplinary practice and her practice is enriched by her learners as well. I also want to briefly mention how generously Jane supports um, and mentors her colleagues across a whole range of activities, teaching, research, feedback on postgraduate writing, thank you Jane, collaborative research projects. We've all at one time or another felt truly supported by Jane. Jane has left an indelible impression on many of the students who have passed through our creative programs over the last 14 years. <coughs> she teaches um, on a range of programs from bridging programs, so pre-degree programs, to degree and postgraduate programs in the School of Design and the Dunedin School of Art. She's had, um, she takes great pleasure um, from seeing learners start their journey on a level four certificate and then going on to complete degrees and sometimes further to postgraduate study. As one learner put it, Jane inspires me by showing what I could do with a bit of practice. 
She's enthusiastic about my learning and when I come up with new material, she's excited for me and helps me improve my skills in a positive way. <coughs> she encourages me to challenge myself and not settle for the easy way out. She's realistic with time frames and learning outcomes. She gives her time to her students. She does many one-on-ones and gets around to every student during each class to help them learn and accelerate their learning. I think one-on-ones help us learn the most and she does this more than any of my other tutors. Thanks Jane, you're an inspirational teacher. I want to close with a whakatauki that describes experiential learning as practiced by Jane and many others at Otago Polytechnic, I would say. And it's reinforced, I think, by the words of that learner that we just heard. Um, so the whakatauki is, ka rongo, ka wareware, ka kite, ka mahara, ka hangia, ka marama ahau. And it um, is translated as, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. Kia ora Jane, we are so grateful to learn with and from you. Good. Oh, yeah, the lapel mic, it's all good. Ah, ko mohua te papa te whenua, ki te noho o kei utipoti anai nei, ki rāro i te maru o kai tahu, ko Pākehā te iwi, ko Venus, ko Vertigan, ko Paul, ko Dobson, ka whānau, ko Wally, Paul, um, Roa, ko John Venus, ka poa, ko Winifred Poole, Roa, ko Jane Venus, ka taua, ko Rowley Venus, uh, Roa, ko Winifred Venus, uh, ka mātua, ko Otene, ko Jane, tohu ko ikoa. Uh, ko Pam, um, Toku uh, toku ho rakatira, uh, aku tamariki ko Toby roa ko Chris, um, uh, toku waru uh, ko Mokapuna, um, tena koto tena koto tena koto kato. Imihi uh, kia korua. Ron, Korua ko Caroline, uh, Hitino Moururu, Kanui, Te Aroha, uh, Kitaka Fano, uh, Fokafatai, Kia Koto, Mo Te Hairi, Kamai. Um, thank you, Ron and Caroline, for your words and big love to you and to all who have come here. Uh, Ketitiro, Fokamua, O te tiri tākou uh, tāku, harika kia koutou. Uh, Kei te rapuara mō te ākou uh, me te mahi toi. I'm looking forward to sharing my journey of learning and teaching in the arts with you. And uh, he pai whānau, uh, me taku mahi, uh, me ka tauira, me hoa mahi, nā koutou i arahi. I poi poi ki te whai i tēnei mahi. Uh, Kei te toho toho i tāku harika ki a koutou. I love you, my family, my work, my students and colleagues. And because of your guidance and encouragement, I've followed this path. Hi mihi tēnei kia. I would like to thank. Firstly, I would like to thank my fabulous partner Pam, who's sitting right here in the front row. Um, Pam, I'd like to thank you for all your support and guidance throughout many years of study and then many years of bizarre projects that have gone into, the, into uh, overtime. And you've <laughs> been so fantastically supportive always. Um, and I'd like to thank um, our son Toby for being here and grandson James who've come from Christchurch, um, which means a lot to me that you're here this evening. Um, 
I would like to, I keep forgetting I've got a lapel mic and I seem to be nailed to the floor right here. I don't have to be, that's right. I can move around. Um, I would really like to thank my mentors. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank um, Professor Leonie Schmidt for years of mentoring um, through projects at art school, but also through my PhD and beyond. Um, really appreciate your ongoing loving support. It means a lot to me. I would also like to thank Bridie, um, Dr. Bridie Loney, who's here somewhere, but I can't spot her. There she is over there, has also been an amazing mentor for me through my masters and also beyond as well. Um, and I would like to thank Caroline. I was just, thank you for your words. Um, and I really appreciate that you talked about my teaching because the focus this evening is more on my research practice. I'm bringing threads of my teaching into it, but it's more focused on the research. So I really appreciate that being acknowledged. And, and you too, Ron, your very kind words. Um, I'd also like to thank my dear friend and colleague, Hannah Joint, who's somewhere, I can see her in the hat. Um, Hannah and I have worked together on many projects throughout the years and as I was putting together slides for this tonight I found some early ones. Um, really appreciate your ongoing support Hannah. And of course everybody else who I thanked earlier I'm thanking again for being here and being part of this wonderful community. So here we go. What will happen? Uh, that's right, don't have to be nailed to the lectern. I'm a sculptor, I'm a musician and a performer. I make absurd musical instruments, some of which you can see right here. Um, machines and contraptions um, that question our continuing uh, thirst for gadgets and unnecessary consumer goods. Some of my works deal with very local issues and unused materials that are specific, uh, specific to our Aotearoa New Zealand and other works um, um, around more global concerns. Tonight I'm going to um, discuss some works, um, and I'll just... Yep. I'm going to discuss some works from a range of these projects, including video snippets and a little bit of live music. You'll be able to trace some threads uh, through my practice relating to specific materials, objects and concerns. I'll introduce you to my community of practice, including artists, comedians, musicians, writers, designers, educators. And I'll also consider how some of my projects have aged. And if you look up here, there is some, uh, it's one of my earlier saxophones, which I redeveloped in the last couple of years. Some works from the instruments, uh, recent instrument exhibitions, and from my PhD projects. And here's one of the latest works which I made. I just finished it uh, three days ago. I think it was on the weekend. So um, that's a kind of a work in progress, but it's got a few things to say for itself. Um, and I'm just going to uh, pop up a slide of some of my performance personas. And we have here, you'll note, DJ Palmolive with her chocolate chip muffin headphones. Uh, and another, another work that I've developed for um, of discussing uh, skateboarders who come to a sticky end on our roads. Not really very funny, and I got a bit of a <laughs> stick for that one. Um, and we have this, this particular person here, Jane Irwin, extreme exhaust pipe wrestler. I'll be playing you a video of her work shortly. But I would like to say that when I consider about my work's ageing, I look at the chocolate chip uh, headphones of DJ Palmolive, and I'm thinking, now would I really be putting something like food on my head? from a, a growing understanding of cultural perspectives. Even though they're plastic chocolate chip muffins, at least I would be having a discussion around it. So things change. Um, most of my artistic practice has been focused on developing projects that highlight the ironies and absurdities of contemporary popular culture. Um, and I can see that there is no shortage of this coming up at a great rate all the time. Um, and my practice is essentially cultural criticism. Many works are viewed through the perspective of critical theory. And educational researchers Kinchlow and McLaren note that a critical theorist is a researcher who attempts to use her work as a form of cultural criticism and accepts certain fundamental assumptions that all thought is mediated by power relations that are socially and historically constituted 
and that facts can never be isolated from the domain of values. So issues relating to power and control are at the very heart of critical social theory, and I negotiate those issues through humour in my projects. So materiality is the focus of this presentation. And materiality is not just about materials used um, to create an artwork, but it's also deeply concerned with the histories and therefore the histories of those materials and therefore the implications of using particular materials and what they say. Because materials are used to tell stories. Um, an artist, um, stories the artist wants to make the viewer aware of. They can also evoke feelings and memories in the viewer. So, of course, once an artwork is in the public domain, um, it may well be open to many other interpretations and um, well beyond the initial interpretations of the artist. And this is what theorist Roland Barthes called the death of the author, because once the work's in the public domain, it's got a life of its own. And a little bit later, I'm going to show you one of my works, which I looked at and totally reinterpreted and it went off into a different direction. So that, honestly, they've, I've got no control over them. So um, I'm one of these people who, the minute I, somebody puts a slide up of any kind of graph, and if it's got more than three arrows, I'm thinking, I don't understand this. Why don't I understand this? However, I do love Venn diagrams. There's only three circles, you know, only three circles. And as you can see that my work, I've got popped in here, but of course, it's a movable feast. Sometimes my work is more humour, less critical theory. Sometimes it's just about materials. But sometimes I look at that work and then consider it under various different lenses and what pops out. So I'm going to tell you about some of those things. I've already gone off the script. I knew that would happen. Um, so we're going to move on to... This is some stills from a, um, a video, uh, Bear Factor, which I filmed some children um, performing extreme makeover on their teddy bears. They were children of a friend of mine, and, she, and we were talking about body image and body, body image in young people. And um, she said, oh, my kids, you know, they go to the second-hand shops and they buy these teddy bears and they start slicing them open and give them nose jobs and all sorts of things. So I said, can I come with a video camera? And I did get permission. They signed the forms. And um, <laughs> so this is, um, this is a work, uh, the, a video called Bear Factor. I'm not showing you the video. I'm just going to show you a couple of images because the kids are now grown up. They may not want a video of them shown tonight. But I'm showing you images without their faces. So I've chosen um, this game to, to look at the feminist uh, perspective of the sort of voracious hunger of the beauty industry. A key feminist theorist important to this work is Susan Bordeaux, um, particularly her text, Unbearable Weight, where she um, examines the power of the media to affect body image, particularly body image in young women. And um, when the children were operating on this particular teddy bear, they were removing large amounts of stuffing out of it and then kept saying to each other, oh no, we have to remove more fat. The bear is too fat. We have to take more fat out. So consider that this is the fat. So um, the next one is um, a koala bear, as you can see, that received <laughs> breast implants. Um, and the breast implants were these two large ping pong balls. Look at the size of them. And of course, to get access into the koala bear to, for it to receive the breast implants, they had to cut the head off quite brutally. <laughs> um, this is kind of it's horrifying but funny. And the girls also had a good sense of irony. They kind of knew what, what, they, what was going on. So to put this work into context, it was one of... Uh, several video works presented in sideshow booths as part of my MFA project called Frequent Viewing, in which I propose that reality TV is essentially a contemporary version of the freak show. So an ugly made beautiful program such as Extreme Makeover, the Western obsession with a perfect face and body is played out to the extreme. The notion of the makeover now seems to be firmly embedded in popular culture to the extent that it's incorporated into the play of children. Um, so those not seen as conventionally beautiful are displayed as freaks. And every time I say the word freaks, I should be going like this. 
and which will become tedious. So I'm just going to do several of these. So every time you hear a freak, just grab one of them from the atmosphere and pop it in. <coughs> so, um, so those not seen as conventionally beautiful are displayed as freaks who after a series of painful operations will fulfil the accepted standards of Western beauty. So um, here we have... Why am I using the clicker? There it is. Okay. So here we have an image of... Uh, from frequent viewing, this is my Snoogle phone, a fairground organ, and there is one of the sideshow booths um, that was part of this. Um, so the materials that I... Um, okay, so I'm just going to step back a bit. I use humour as cultural criticism to provide an entry point um, to works that have deeper and darker issues at their core. So when creating and discussing works that are designed to comment on society, such as Bear Factor, it can be a challenge to delineate between the difference, uh, the difference between representation and critique, particularly when the work contains elements of both. Representation appears to be less objective than critique, um, as evidenced on a daily basis in the media. However, over-representation can be used for critique um, because uh, I'm just thinking of performance artist Nao Bustamante, who has this notion of cracking stereotypes by embodying them. So you're sort of over-representing something to send it over the top. And this is a familiar territory for many comedians, thinking of people like Tracy Ullman um, and Catherine Tate. Um, and this approach is highlighted in Bear Factor, where Miss Koala's head is cut off to, to uh, gain access for a breast, a breast implants, the implication being beauty at, any uh, beauty at any price is worth the pain. So um, here we have the sideshow booths. Um, now, am I blocking anybody's view of the screen standing here? Yours? No? Okay. So the materials I speak of in this work are, tr are transitory, and they talk of that transitory nature of carnival. The booths are flimsy, provisional materials, um, and the structures sort of echo the painted stripes of canvas that you would see in carnival tenting. Um, and also the floor is covered with sawdust. My mic, is it coming and going a bit? It's okay? Oh, good. The floor is covered in, in sawdust. Um, just imagining that sort of any errant sort of animal droppings would be able to be soaked up at any moment. So um, I'm now going to, or am I? Yes. I'm going to show you some of the works that were in frequent viewing. Um, the drums. Uh, and as you can see that... Um, the drums kind of echo this kind of aesthetic of the cobble together, but they also speak of people like Dr. Seuss and Heath Robinson. And they have, there's a conceptual work, not only in the shape of this ridiculous drum kit, but also because um, the works of Seuss have power dynamics at their core, and he always champions the underdog. So that sort of comes through in some of the materials that I'm using. Um, the carnival brass band instruments are made from disused plumbing components, and they speak of things that can easily be assembled and packed down using a pipe wrench. Like the drums, they're not slick, and they have a handmade aesthetic which um, shows the marks of the maker. So at the heart of frequent viewing, a Russian theorist Mikhail Bakhtin's exploration of the power of carnival in the Middle Ages as a tool for temporary overturning power structures, temporarily overturning. Um, and at this, at this time, the peasant population could mock and satirise authority figures, figures in the church, figures in the town, um, all from the safety of the carnival mask. And it was a time for in, indulging in um, excessive amounts of drinking and revelling and eating, um, and that was before the deprivations of Lent kicked in, and then after Lent, back to the sort of lives of daily toil. Um, Bakhtin turned, termed this uh, temporary process of overturning hierarchies is the carnivalesque. A criticism of the carnivalesque has been that carnival functioned as a safety valve because the peasant populations could let off steam for a short time, but in effect, it lessened the likelihood of a full-scale rebellion. Um, in uh, Subversive Pleasures, um, a text by media theorist Robert Stram, he talks about two distinct types of carnival this bottom-up, topsy-turvy world of in inverted hierarchies that we were just talking about, and also what he calls degraded carnival. And degraded carnival is a sort of carnival from the um, 
the time of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, where showmen like um, what's his name W. T. Barnum um, exhibited human oddities or freaks for um, the spectacle of the paying public. So at this time, there was a horrible kind of cataloging and collecting of native peoples. Um, people like you know the wild man of Borneo. All of these people were actually collected and became part of these freak shows that were touring around. I'm now going to show you some images from the carnival opening event, accompanied by some sounds from the night, um, which is including the band that played live, and some sounds from the sideshow barker. with great pride, the dog-faced boy. Am I barking mad? No, sir. He's not for you a two other cow. Not one, but two others on one cow. Can you believe it? work, oh well, no you don't, <laughs> the next work is also part of frequent viewing and it spoke to two schools of reality TV programming, the extreme home handyman Jesse James type character how whereby lawnmowers were turned into hovercraft and the don't try this at home sort of macho ranger hero and you'll see when I play this video why I dedicated it to Steve Irwin. We're going to play a bit of it and then I'm going to whip along towards more towards the end because there's not time to play the whole video. What? Why are you doing this? Ooh. Oh, crikey! Oh. Harry, get around! Get the catching bag! These lizards are like land crocodiles. And their teeth are like tiger sharks. And if you get too close, whack! They'll power whack you. Oh, you're a slippery little guy. Like here is a battle of strength and endurance. The only way to toss this croc is to wear him out. He's got the strength of three blokes my size. Get it, dog, go on, run. Our only means of restraining him is via a top jaw rope. Get her on the top jaw rope, dog. It's critical to get his top jaw secured. Lassoing those gnashing, thrashing teeth doesn't come easy. Get it on, babe. I can't get it. She's thrashing too hard. If I loosen my grip, he'll rip me to shreds. Go, 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 go! I got it, I got it! Hang on, I got her off! Gary, I got him! Hey, hey, hey. Okay, we're gonna move along a bit. This is very, very dangerous. One slip by Steve and this clock could have his hand. The animal could even flip our small boat over with no trouble at all. Right, he's angry. Barry, I got him! Too easy, mate. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Glad you enjoyed that. I dedicated that to Steve Urban because the week that I finished editing it, he died. So it was really sad and I wasn't sure whether I was going to show it in my exhibition and then I decided to show it and dedicate it to him. Um, I'm now taking a step back in time because of the connection being the exhaust pipe. I love exhaust pipes. I used to rummage around all those sort of bins and magoo mufflers and places like that, raiding them for, for parts for this particular exhibition which um, you can see by the title, is about noises made at night. <laughs> and um, it was about boy racer culture. And it's one of several works where I also discuss masculinities and gender stereotyping, where were the girl races. Um, but this particular work um, was made way back in 2002, and I sampled a lot of local boy races exhaust systems to create the soundtrack. And I'm going to play you a little bit of that. 
to this work um, is Beer Faced Lies. And Beer Faced Lies um, was really talking about um, the sort of stoic New Zealand bloke who has very little to say until he's had a beer or two. And this particular work had a tear tab and I activated the tear tab by pulling it and the soundtrack was a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of blokes in the pub, one of the sportsman's bars. And this was in the era long before you had to worry about things like uh, ethics approvals. <laughs> so I wandered in, I, I wandered in with a secret microphone and recorded all these guys, and they're all talking about their diffs and all these sort of car parts, and we're all going, rrr, rrr, rrr. so anyway. So I made the soundtrack and multi-tracked it and created this work. And um, in this beautiful moment of what I think of as graphic surprise, I crushed this can in a car crusher, and when I went to put the handmade stencils in, because I did it all by hand, it turned out to say fight, not spates. And I did not intend that, but it was just one of those things that happened. And this particular work um, also was underpinned by some very interesting research by a lovely woman, the late Robin Law, who did a lot of work around beer advertising and place in New Zealand. And she did a project uh, around various different beer brands and the personas that advertise them. So when I made this, I was working around the idea of Southern man and Southern woman, and Southern man reflected the landscape, that Southern landscape, the very sort of dry, um, sort of brown dry, and um, wandering off into the distance for his next beer. So sort of hard as well, I'm just thinking of that Otago landscape. Played beautifully, or underplayed beautifully by um, the late Frank Whitton. So here we're getting a little bit closer. This was downstairs here in the Dunedin Public Art Gallery. Um, as you can see by the gorgeous wooden shiny floor and this work um, <coughs> is called Gymnasium. And Gymnasium was a pseudo gym. This was an interactive exhibition where people could come in and ride these machines. Um, visitors they could ride the absurd fitness machines that question the obsession with obtaining and retaining an ideal body. The fitness machines were in a sense ideal bodies, long, lean and shiny. And I think of these as life, Christ, life crisis Harley exercycles. Um, because kind of exercising on the spot and steppers and, and, uh, and, and machines that go nowhere um, is kind of trying to make up the gr lost ground and recapture the body of one's youth. And it's a time when those types of bikes, the real banana seat, ape hanger type bikes, were ridden by, um, in the outside world, by the very customers who are now expected to hold back the tide and tone up. So I thought this was kind of a bit ironical, really. Uh, here's one of my works, low, uh, low Fat Low Rider and a sidecar named Desire. And you'll note that in the little video cockpit, the little cockpit there, you've got a video work, and I'm going to play you some of that video. It's for my Absolution Ab Machine, and you'll have that will be coming up. And um, in the background, there's the spiky punch bag, and I'll tell you a little bit about that shortly. So we have a close-up of Low Fat Low Rider. Now, a lot of these works, um, a vital influence in my work is Chindogu, which is a Japanese creative form for intentionally producing useless products. And you can see a sidecar attached to an exocycle is extremely useless. Um, and Chindogu, to quote Kenji Kawakami, who was the person who developed this concept, um, they represent the freedom of thought and action, the freedom to, to challenge the suffocating historical dominance of conservative utility. I love that. The freedom to be almost useless. So I'm going to show you some chindogu examples. And I always calling it chindogu, as though it's about dogs. And it's Japanese, so it's actually chindogu. But I often have trouble remembering that. So um, here is not a chindogu example, but it's a forerunner. 
Um, Mireille Oppenheim made this in 1936. She wouldn't have considered this to be a chindogu because they hadn't been invented yet. But you can imagine well, how, what a useless product this is. It was developed for keeping her tea warm and it was made, it was, this was wrapped in Chinese gazelle fur. So you can imagine the minute you had a mouthful of sort of tepid Chinese gazelle fur, you will realise how useless this object absolutely is. Here is um, a chindogu of Kawakami's, and this is called detachable tooth covers. And he developed this um, to solve the problem of the minute you eat something after cleaning your teeth, your teeth are dirty once again. So clean your teeth in the morning, pop in the detachable tooth covers, and off you go. Um, in your day, you can eat things with, uh, um, what's that, parsley, you know, terrible for the teeth, things like that because you're wearing these. But all good chindogu, how always create a worse problem. They, they create a, another problem in their wake, even though they may solve the first problem. So, of course, this problem is not hard to imagine. We have another chindogu here, the back scratcher. And I think this... Kami says, you know, if you develop something and it's so handy you use it all the time, you haven't made a chindogu. And I think this is on the... It's almost on the cusp. So the person who's having their back scratched has a little card. They wear the T-shirt, the scratchor, is poised, and you go, um, H3. Uh, no, 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 H, no, H5. Yeah, that's it. So it takes all of that kind of um, difficulty out of locating spots. Just say no more. Right. Um, here we have another work that, um, although it's not Chindogu, I, I looked at this work and considered it under the lens of Chindogu. It's this huge upturned tank at the Venice Biennale in 2011, and it's this laboriously clanking mechanism, and um, a team of United States athletes jogged on the treadmill. And I'm looking at this work because um, materiality is kind of a key um, part of this uh, presentation, and you can already see that I've been talking about things like making works from exhaust pipes and things that have kind of been cobbled together. And now I've kind of moved into an area where I've been making slicker work using things like chrome. And this is sort of somewhere in between. This, is, this has got the cobbled together, clunky thing going on. But it also talks of two very unpleasant materials. And if we go back to earlier on in my talk, I was saying materiality is also about the histories of the materials and what they actually do in an artwork. So these materials have an unpleasant history, both the tank and the treadmill. The treadmill was actually an, uh, an instrument of torture, and it still is for many people in the gym. Um, and that is why uh, I'm, I'm using this work to discuss my gym works, even though their work was to talk about nationalism in the Biennale. It had a different focus. We have Mona Hatoum, a Palestinian artist who is based in Britain, and her works are around the fragility of life for an immigrant never feeling like you're safe and you've arrived somewhere. So here we have this baby's cot made of glass, and you can imagine that it's not possible to put an infant in this cot. So um, I also looked at her work under the lens of Chindogu, even though she did not have that intention when she made it. Um, here we have something which is actually quite vital to kind of the theoret sort of the theoretical underpinning of my project Gymnasium. Because Gymnasium was about gym and it was about the fitness industry and the construction of the ideal body and how so many people were under pressure to create an ideal body. And so we're getting older and gravity's having us its way and yet there's this pressure, you know, 70's the new 50 and 30's the new... 15 or whatever, um, and there's a lot of pressure to keep toning up and lots of people are watching. So when I look at uh, the Panopticon, I'm thinking of Michelle Foucault who um, explored uh, Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon prison system whereby there would be a guard or guards on the central pod here and all of the cells could be um, surveyed. It's about surveillance. So people never knew when they were under surveillance. And so I'm applying this um, with the help of some sports theorists called Fru and McGillivray, who talk about how the panopticon can also be applied to the contemporary gymnasium. 
where people are under the guide, uh, under the um, the surveillance of um, other gym users, but also personal trainers. There are mirrors everywhere, so there's not so many private moments. Um, I'm just, I was going to play this, but I can actually see the time is galloping on, so I'll just briefly say that uh, this was also another work that I was considering as part of the family of Chindogu, and it is um, the ultimate machine. Because in the gym, um, the machine is paramount. The machine is, has a lot of control over people's lives. And I'm going to talk about some of my fitness machines and how that works. So just keep your eye on the ultimate machine because the minute you turn it on, this little hand comes out and turns it off. So really, it exists purely for the purpose of turning itself off. And so um, it's, a, it's a thing about the machine having the upper hand. And I consider sometimes machines in the gym have the upper hand. And that's what a lot of my work is about. And here we have um, Caleb, one of our grandsons, riding this machine which had a game on it. And uh, it's just reminding us that we don't lie to the machine. Just give me a second here and I will... So this machine, the machine has been historically linked with an imbalance of power and has been portrayed as a symbol of dystopia in popular culture, literature, film and art. <coughs> Within this trope, there are memorable examples of black humour, um, of absurd machines and disgrinting, uh, disintegrating machinist uh, dystopias. A subtext to gymnasium is to suggest that contemporary gym could be considered part of this lineage. The, the machines of gymnasium question the consumer science of the fitness industry, in particular the current and seemingly futile obsession with obtaining an ideal body. body. I'll try that again. Obtaining an ideal body in an increasingly shorter and shorter time frame. And everybody's familiar with the infomercials, like get your, your abs happening in five minutes a day, three minutes a day, only takes two minutes a day, and you're going to get the perfect body. So, it's time for an infomercial break. <laughs> Introducing Absolution, the guilt-free, instant method that turns flab into ab. How do you think it would feel to transform your body into a vibrant, energy-packed ball of muscle? At last, the ab machine you've been waiting for, an exercise-free, diet-free, guilt-free solution to turn your flabby tummy into the six-pack of your dreams. Let's take a look at Absolution to see how it works. Two weighted stands support the flexible bungee strapping that houses the ab pad, the Absolution ab support system. The flabby user steps firmly into the absolution and their body is instantly transformed as the flab is gently squeezed through the hollow cells. I'm now going to introduce you to Ian who will demonstrate the absolution here in the studio. Hi Ian, great to have you on board. Hi Jane, fantastic to be on the show. Well this is the moment the viewers have been waiting for. Please step into the app pad Ian. Oh wow, that's some transformation. I feel like I'm in the zone. How does it feel? It feels fantastic to look so ripped. And it's totally stress-free. Wow. So is it easy to use the absolution? Can you tell your viewers about that? With the absolution, Jane, there's no punishing three-minute daily workouts. You can keep on eating and drinking whatever you like. In fact, it's better to grow fatter because the more flab, the bigger the ab. Well, you've certainly got some great abs there, Ian. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'd now like to welcome Dr Judy McGee, who led the team of scientists who developed the ab pad. Judy. Oh, Dr McGee. Ah, welcome to the show. The secret of absolution is the ab pad, which uses the patented power extruder system which literally turns ugly, flabby fat into potent muscle as it's forced through the extrusion cells of the ab pad. 
As the fat is extruded, a chemical change results in the cells. The fat cells start mimicking actual muscle cells and fooling these cells to act and behave as muscle does, taut, solid and lean. <laughs> so I'm just going to move just to the very end of this where I'm going to demonstrate the door flex. You don't have to have the weighted stand, you can actually have this at home. I think it might be around here somewhere. Yes, yes, there it is. So the door flex hangs on any door, so you can actually burst through the door flex and be ready to greet people <laughs> who will see how trim and toned you look. So um, getting to a bit of theory, it had to happen again. Um, one can view the absolution video and see how the fitness and health industry thrives on binaries. Fit, fat, ripped, flabby. But also how binaries are overturned through, through this work. By physically engaging with the absolution machine, the notion of deconstruction is physically played out. Where the fat and flab have the upper hand. And in an absurd twist, fat becomes a desirable commodity. We see Bakhtin's ideas surrounding the carnivalesque also present in this work particularly his notion of carnival ambivalence, where ridicule and abuse is always the other side of praise and celebration. Where um, I feel this ambivalence when using the absolution machine, pride in my newfound abs, and regret and shame that they're not the real thing. So I'm going to... And this is the perfect um, weight to be using with the absolution machine. And this was part of several works that were designed for people who didn't actually want to exercise at all, but felt that they should be toning up so they could wander around the gym with a towel or something, and then be picking up the weightless weights and be really in the zone. So here we have um, a young woman picking up these weights. She is, well, I think that's three years old in this photograph, and she gave me her permission to use this photo tonight. Um, this particular work here, Jab, the spiky punch bag, this is one of the kind of, um, the notion, it, it brings us to the notion um, of the carnivalesque again, but thinking back to the first, the first uh, what was called frequent viewing, where we looked at the idea of the carnivalesque, the carnival being a short time frame when um, the peasant populations could overindulge, in the, in the gymnasium project, I'm proposing to kind of push the envelope a bit further. So I argue that the carnivalesque um, and now can be viewed from one of shifting time frames. Rather than carnival being a short time of excessive indulgence before the deprivations of Lent, I propose that in de uh, sort of developed Western countries, we're in this uh, sort of perpetual carnival. Um, whereby we indulge in excessive amounts of alcohol, fattening food, and constant entertainment. Think back to the Spate's 44-gallon drum beer cans, industrial amounts of alcohol. Thus, in gymnasium, the notion of gym is a Lenten site. Um, th this is what we're proposing. It's a place to receive absolution from all this carnival uh, excess, the carnivalist excess that's happening most of the time. So this is expressed in darkly humorous works, such as spike-laden punch bags and weights that sort of um, echo this notion of self-flagellation and repentance through exercise. So go out in the gym and give yourself a really hard time to kind of pay your body back for all of that excess. But this particular work, um, if we go back thinking of Roland Barthes, and I was saying, you know, that once works out there in the world, it has a life of its own, and the author is more absent, and people will view works from a different perspective. The artist can also come back and look at a work many years later and think, gosh, I could think that this could be saying something totally different. So I saw a call for uh, artworks to go to uh, a show in San Francisco about social justice, and I reframed this work and I made it, uh, a, and it discusses domestic violence, and it discusses the fact that the perpetrator is also harmed, as much, well, not as much, but the perpetrator is harmed as well as the victim when they engage in domestic violence, and often it's something that's cyclical, carries on through families, um, and it's, just, it's not a simple thing to solve. So this work talked about that. 
Um, uh, here's another one of the sort of darker works of repentance, the Swiss ball with spikes. So you can really feel you're giving yourself a hard time when you're engaging in, in work like this. And this particular work was inspired by Man Ray's Iron. Uh, I'm a Kaju, I'm giving it my best shot for the French. Um, made in 1921, but there were many, uh, there were quite a lot of, um, just trying to think of the word, editions of this iron made. So there were quite a lot. Some were made in 1952. There were several runs of this work made. I saw this very early one in the Surrealist Exhibition in Brisbane, in Goma, um, several years ago. And I had seen this work many times, but only on screen or in books. And I wasn't prepared for the impact it would have on me when I saw it actually in the flesh. And I realised that it was an instrument of torture, not just um, an object that was a humorous object. So that made me think, you know, I wrote about this work in the gallery. And it's something that I do with my students a lot. I would take my students with me to see exhibitions. And we write in the space in front of the work. And since that I've been doing that rather than people take photos or they look at work and then come back and write, once people are writing in the space, wonderful things happen with their writing because they're, whoops, whoo, because they're having a relationship with the work and they're not only describing it, but they're describing their response to it. Um, now moving on to some more recent work. This work was in the Forest Gallery. Uh, in Omaru, and it also went to Invercargill. So um, it was ex uh, exhibited quite locally, but a small collection from this exhibition was also part of the Anything Could Happen exhibition that went off to Shanghai, curated by um, Professor Margot Barton, uh, Jane, Dr Jane Malthus, and Anthony Deeker from the Council put this group, uh, uh, these works together, uh, from artists who had connections with Dunedin. So it's really lovely to be included in that. So on the Lost Object Ensemble, um, of which this is a, a small section, my focus is still on Shindogu. But this time I, I focus on absurd multi-purpose devices um, with a particular focus on instruments that double as kitchen utensils. You can see the wok cello there. Um, in the Lost Object Ensemble, I overturn the notion of found materials by creating musical instruments from objects that appear to have lost their way. One example is the panjo. The panjo? One example is the panjo, um, which is constructed from a copper bottom frying pan. And this functions as both a cooking utensil and a playable instrument. So this particular body of work lies between instrument design and contemporary art practice. These objects critique popular culture, but reference the history of instrument making, whereby in poorer communities, instruments were often made from whatever materials came to hand. And you can see, we may not be able to see very well, but the, uh, the little tail piece is made from a fork twisted round to take the strings. Um, obviously, the frying pan back, and I think uh, there's various other found materials in this work. The panjo's former life, if we're going back to materiality and how important it is that materials you use reference their particular histories and remain visible in the work, or in my work, um, the former life as a frying pan is evoked in a satirical work, The Eggs Factor, which I'm going to show you. And this particular video you're about to see will um, it talks about reality television cooking and talent quest programs. So I'm still exploring popular culture and the things that are beamed into our homes 24-7. The X Factor also critiques the overabundance of infomercials for pointless devices, and, but with a focus on multifunctional objects. And you will see um, when you see this video that I developed uh, the panjo for people who are obsessed with fame. They can not only enter something like My Kitchen Rules or MasterChef, they can also enter New Zealand Scott Talent or any of the other talent shows. So it's something that is a, a facilitator of instant fame. <laughs> now, what we're going to do, we're going to start it about here. Won't you be me, Susan? Susan, I could eat all and eat food. 
introducing the panjo, the multi-purpose instrument for the musician cook. Not only is this a functional musical instrument, it is also a top of the line, copper bottom frying pan that any chef would be proud to hang in their kitchen. With the panjo, some very small adjustments allow you to turn this into the frying pan. All you need to do is remove these very few clamps around the edge of the skin, the skin comes away, the strings roll up, and there you are, ready to use the panjo as a frying pan. Imagine the different purposes of the panjo around the... We're not going to imagine them, we're going to whip along a bit, because this, like any infomercial, is long. Once whip. the legs have all been loosened, uh, now it's time to loosen the strings before removing the banjo skin. Turn the, turn the panjo over. We're not going to go through that, we're just going to... The strings from stage is to turn it over imagine. again. Loosening these up. I'm now going to remove the last remaining strut and the banjo skin and frame will just fall out onto the workbench. And there we have it. These pieces now, of course, we're going to be putting aside for when we reassemble the banjo for the next music session. Over here. And we are left with the panjo. The very versatile, multi-purpose instrument that turns from just a few moments into <laughs> talk to you about how the panjo has the X factor. With the panjo, you can become a reality TV star. You can star in New Zealand's Got Talent, plus MasterChef, My Kitchen Rules. All of things are possible when you have the multi-purpose panjo. I'm now going to demonstrate to you how easy it is to cook your eggs in the panjo. Wait for it to sort of heat up a little bit so we get a really good sizzle on. Oh, I hear that panjo sizzling away with those eggs. Absolutely delicious. Here we are, fried eggs on the panjo, ladies and gentlemen. Call 0800 Panjo for you. You've seen how the panjo, the really fancy and the carrot grating ukulele it's player, one of the at the same time also be playing music and creating a salad. This is how it works. Okay, we're not going to go in. I just thought I want to show you a little clip of the uh, carrot grating ukulele because if you order the panjo, you want to first call it, you of course receive the carrot grating ukulele. <laughs> Absolutely free. But um, I can see the time is of the essence, so we're going to move on. Um, I had somebody ask me if they could buy one. This was exhibited in the Otago Museum and this very well-meaning person said to me, can I, where can I buy one of these? I didn't know what to say. <laughs> and here we have uh, the wok body cello. I was initially going to fry things in that as well and add to the infomercial, but I'm kind of fond of this instrument and I've decided not to stain it with cooking. <laughs> um, very briefly, um, so that was, the, that was the kind of the end of a whole series of bodies of works that have been exhibited in, in galleries here in some of them overseas. I've got new work that I've just started making, the PowerShell works, which haven't been exhibited anywhere yet. And in fact, tonight is the first time <coughs> they've been seen in public. They've been seen in various stages in my office and workshop and things. Um, but I'd also like to digress into a totally different realm for a minute and talk briefly about another part of my practice which is a collaborative part with my friend and colleague Hannah Joint and Hannah and I play music together, uh, we don't actually, um, I play music and Hannah draws but it feels like we're jamming, we often talk, we call it jamming so um, 
we work together where we spontaneously bounce off each other. Um, and I'm going to play you a little bit of an, a work which involves the chaloc. Now, oh, no, I'm not. Where is it? Come back. There it is. Um, I'm going to play you a work which involves the cello, and I'm just going to play you at just the beginning of it, um, so you get a little bit of an idea about our process. So it's called Stringline Melt. <laughs> Essentially, Hannah's interpreting my sounds with her mark making. because we're going to actually move on to some live music, but I just wanted to share that little bit with you, and we will have um, some of our work is going to be in the Ashburton Gallery over summer, and you'll be able to see some of our videos and also us performing live there as well. Um, I'm just going to play, uh, show you um, a couple of slides of references. I didn't want to finish on the slide, but these are people that I've referenced, and... I'm going to talk to you now about the PowerShell instruments and play some music for you. And this may be a familiar image. The Fred and Myrtle Fluties Powerhouse um, from Bluff, which is now part of the Canterbury Museum. And why I'm showing you this image is um, one day Fred came home with a PowerShell and put it on the wall. And look what happened. <laughs> one day... I got given this guitar by Caroline, thank you. And this was a children's guitar and I started playing around with it and ripped all its frets out to make a fretless guitar and made a little PowerShell pick board for it. And look what happened. <laughs> so I think of Fred and Myrtle fondly. I can understand how this sort of thing arises. And here we have all of these various PowerShell instruments. I will play this one, which has got a little bit of power. And they are called um, Power Trip, this group of instruments. Now, um, so I'm going I'm to play a little bit of this, um, this instrument first, do a little bit of multi-tracking, and then I'll pick up the very kitsch. They're a series of hyper-kitsch instruments. And as Fred and Myrtle's living room is hyper-kitsch, they're an inspiration. Um, so I couldn't leave the corrugated power alone. It had to have something to push it over the edge into true horror. So I added the Taihamu, the possum.
possum had the upper hand then, it decided to untune itself, and I was trying to tune it up as I was going, but it's, um, what can you do? Anyway, what's the time? 20 past, I was going to sing a song, I don't think we've got time, have we? Have we? Okay. Now, um, there's only one slight problem with the song, is that, um, now looking at words, I need to put it on something so I can read the words. Can I grab one of these chairs? Yep, thank you. Pardon? Oh, go on, Ron, you could be my beautiful young assistant. So we can dispense with this beast. Fantastic. So this is, um, in fact, before, before I sing the song, because I'm really going to finish on this song, I would just like to make one more statement to sort of to tie everything together, hopefully, um, about materials. And I just wanted to say that um, no material is innocent. And in fact, that uh, no artist is innocent when they're using materials. And I just wanted to leave you with that thought, seeing I've now finished playing with the power and various things. And I'm back to this, this guitar, which is also has materials to talk about, but I'll shut up and sing the song. This is a song about the joys of teaching. that song last year for the ARCO conference, uh, teaching conference. I will be very brief. Uh, I was asked to respond very briefly to Jane's presentation and I just have a few words to say. 
Uh, Jane Venus and I have known each other for a long time. Firstly, Jane, firstly we taught art history and theory to stage one students together for years and we devised many innovative ways of engaging learners with complex material, making connections between theory and studio practice. Jane and I had enormous fun in designing new models of teaching and observing the sometimes hilarious and always empowering outcomes for students. Amidst the fun and games, a serious aim underpinned what we did together, namely to support each and every student toward what, towards whatever success meant for them. And I will always be grateful to you, Jane, for those wonderful times. Jane's sense of humour lightened and lightens any workload, and I truly think that this ability is central to the success of all her endeavours. From those early days of collaborative teaching in art history and theory, through to creative studies teaching and postgraduate supervision, and her own Master of Fine Arts and PhD research. Humour is not enough though. It has to be in aid of something. In Jane's case, humour is coupled with a stand for the underdog and for social justice. Eli Siegel writes that humour in art is a play between sameness and differences, with difference pre predominating, concord and discord, with discord predominating, the symmetrical and the asymmetrical, with the asymmetrical predominating, the large and the small, with the small predominating, the important and the unimportant, with the unimportant predominating. In Jane's work, difference, discord, the asymmetrical, the small, and the unimportant are given pride of place. In these ways, her work mimics the strategy of the carnivalesque as it has been deployed since medieval times in European culture, something that Jane has mentioned a couple of times in her presentation. This strategy uses the event of the carnival to upend existing hierarchies and authorities. The high becomes the low, the king becomes the servant, the worker becomes the master, even if only for a day. In this way, social tensions are released and alternative ways of doing things are highlighted. Fundamental to the <coughs> carnivalesque is the urge towards unmasking the inequities of prevailing systems and doing so through humour and what is often called in cultural theory, turning the world upside down. From medieval literature to actual carnivals in olden times and in our times, the world upside down has played a major part in calls for doing things differently, to, for doing things differently to make the world a better place. <coughs> Jane Venus's postgraduate studies, her culturally critical studio practice, her inclusive teaching and the roles of generosity she plays on campus in our everyday lives live up to these up to this ideal. She does this in ways which tease, joke, cajole, sometimes pokes and digs, but never hurts. It has been a privilege to walk some of the way with Jane and to be present tonight at her inaugural lecture as a now new full professor at Otago Polytechnic, a position she heartily deserves. Thank you, Jane, and thank you all for being present at this special event tonight. Aroha to Jane and Pam and the family and to all here tonight. Thank you. Kia ora. So, Jane, it just remains for me, on behalf of Phil Kerr, our Chief Executive at Otago Polytechnic, and our Otago Polytechnic Whanau, and everyone here to thank you for your amazing lecture. Um, I just wanted to say, I think these flowers are pretty much like Jane. They, they put on a great show, they are beautiful, they are colourful, and they are very well deserved. So, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.